Hey everyone, I'm Nick and welcome back to Lafayette Systems. I'm building this rocket called Sapphire. It uses a GPS-assisted inertial navigation system in its nose and a custom 3D printed control system in its tail. Today we're going to be building its homemade carbon fiber nose cone using a 3D printed mold. I'm going to show you one technique that didn't really work and then I'll show you one technique that worked really well. And by the end of today, hopefully you'll be able to make your own rocket airframe components out of carbon fiber all by yourself. So before we start, let's talk about what a composite material is. Carbon fiber, just like fiberglass or reinforced concrete, is a composite material. Composite materials are composites of two completely different subcomponents. They use the strengths from each component to offset the weaknesses of the other. Now this differs from a more traditional homogeneous material like this bulk metal because bulk metal, even if there's multiple different atoms that make it up, is basically all the same. If you slice this up, you won't see like strips of different materials in there. It's all homogeneously mixed together. Composite materials, as should be evident, are different. Composites as a class have a number of unique characteristics. First, composites generally have really strange or unique manufacturing techniques that let you make really complex parts like this nose cone surprisingly easily. Second, they have really good strength to weight ratios, or at least they can. This is why you see composites all the time in aerospace or in really high performance applications like Formula One. Third, composite materials are usually non-isotropic. This means that if you have a cube of carbon fiber, its strength depends on which side of the cube you push on. This lets engineers apply strength, not just in the places that matter the most, but in the directions that matter the most, which help us reduce the overall weight of the material even further. I'm using carbon fiber to make Sapphire's nose cone because it's very strong, it's very rigid, and this nose cone does not need to be RF transparent. Each composite material is a little bit different, but because the underlying carbon fibers in here are conductive, this part ends up being a Faraday cage. So if you have an antenna that's buried in here, it won't be able to transmit out, and we would have to use something like fiberglass or a Kevlar composite instead. Sapphire isn't designed with an antenna in here, so I'm gonna go with full carbon fiber to make great use of the high rigidity of this material. Carbon fiber is a composite material made up of two different components. The first is a fabric made of super thin pure carbon strings. And you can see the, the pattern of the fabric shining through in this section of airframe. The second component of carbon fiber is an epoxy resin. The fabric is super strong in tension. The carbon fibers are one of the highest strength to weight ratios material, but only in tension. And the resin is super strong in compression. When they're combined, they make a part that's super strong in both tension and compression. When we manufacture carbon fiber parts, we take layers of fabric and we layer them over something like a mold or a mandrel. We then apply the epoxy resin, which cures over the parts, and then we generally have to flash off the ends and sand down the part a little bit to get to its final geometry. Okay, before we build our own nose cone, let's talk about how amateur rocket composite nose cones are traditionally made. Nose cones and other cylindrical parts are particularly difficult if you use an inner mold like this one. This is where we have a mold and we're laying the composite material around it. Because this is a giant cylinder, we can't peel any material away. So we have to pull the mold out of our composite part when we're done. This means we have to have a very low surface friction coefficient between our mold and our final part. With a 3D printed mold, this is particularly difficult because we usually have a bunch of layer lines that are increasing the surface area and letting the epoxy hold onto and binds to the mold. What's a very common technique in amateur rocketry is to stretch something over the mold that's very smooth and that will act as a mold release material. Okay, we're gonna stay monetized here. Let's imagine what types of things might work well as a good nose cone mold release. We want a thin, stretchy, cylindrically shaped material, preferably with some kind of like mold release or lubricant already applied to the outside. As it turns out, there are a couple of commercial products that fit that description. Uh, typically, we take these mold release uh, sleeves and we slide a couple of them over the tube. And then when we remove the mold from inside of our composite part, we're actually slipping each mold release layer against one another. And then we just pull out the excess when we're done. This technique definitely works and has produced some really high quality nose cones for folks all across amateur rocketry, but it does have some downsides. First is your mold diameter. Each sleeve adds a little bit of thickness to your mold's outer diameter, and that affects the inner diameter of your final part. So if you want a really tight inner diameter tolerance, you need to really carefully measure your mold with all of the composite mold release sleeves on top of it 
uh, and then you need to tune your mold geometry and diameter to get a final part that actually works for you. The second problem is that getting sleeves in like rocketry relevant sizes is actually relatively difficult. Uh, Sapphire uses a 90 millimeter diameter body tube. And it turns out that is significantly larger than the typical application for this type of uh, product. So you end up having to use like double or triple XL uh, mold release sleeves. And you have to get these from like specialty stores. So this isn't really something you can like go to like Home Depot or like CVS and get. The third issue is you need to be careful about how these sleeves are constructed. So some of these sleeves have ribs uh, for structural integrity reasons. Uh, which is great, but unfortunately those ribs will imprint on the inner surface of your nose cone and they'll also make the nose cone binds to the, the mold uh, when it's done curing. And that is not good. So we need the like smooth plain Jane version of these mold releases. Uh, so you just need to be really careful how you source those. I wanted to make a composite nose cone technique where you don't need the specialty mold releases and that you can use your 3D printer to make the mold. So at the end of the day, I'm trying to figure out a way that we can 3D print this and have it not stick to the carbon fiber nose cone when you're done with it. Plan number one is to use a melt-away plastic 3D printed mold. So I'll 3D print the mold and then I'll put my carbon fiber over it and let it cure. When that's all done, I'll toss the entire thing in the oven and then I'll let the mold just melt out. If this works, I won't really need to worry about the surface bonding between the mold and the part because the plastic just melts away at the very end. I've been learning a lot about making composites, but what if you want to learn more about other essential rocketry skills like math and programming? Today's sponsor, Brilliant.org, has you covered. Brilliant's hands-on lessons help you learn complicated subjects quickly, and daily encouragement helps you keep your learning goals on track. Brilliant helps you build a good foundation first before helping you progress to more and more challenging problems. So if you're a complete beginner or you're trying to refresh some of the things you learned in college, Brilliant has lessons for you. Brilliant has just released their new Programming with Functions course, which helps you master creating and calling functions in software. This is a super important skill when your code gets more complex. If you're ready to start learning for free today, go to brilliant.org Lafayette, scan the QR code on screen, or click my link in the video description. Brilliant's also offering composites experts like you 20% off an annual premium subscription, which gives you unlimited daily access to all of the courses in Brilliant's catalog. So plan number one is to use a melt-away plastic 3D printed mold. I chose PLA for the mold material because it has the lowest melting point of any of the filaments that I have. First, I prepped the nose cone layup and I applied a tiny bit of mold release to the mold. I just used this spray on mold release that's worked really well in other projects. I then added six sleeves of wetted carbon fiber and I let the part cure. I also tried this thing where I wrapped peel ply around the circumference of the part to add a bit of manual compression, and this did not work at all. So that's why there's this weird kind of spiraling pattern. I would not suggest you guys try this. Oh, I'm just bashing into the top there. Uh, all right, one second. Let me see if I can pull it really, really hard. Ah, <laughs> uh, that's not working at all. All right, you're going in the oven. So then I did a couple rounds of tossing it in the oven, hoping to just heat the outer little bit of plastic and let it release from the mold. I 
quick update on the nose cone that I laid up yesterday. Um, too much epoxy and the mold, the 3D printed mold inside of it is ultra mega stuck. So I tried to oven it, I tried to freezer it, I tried to whack it, I tried to poke it, I tried to pull it, tried all sorts of stuff and it is not coming out. So we're just gonna have to do this again and rethink how we're doing the molds. Everybody, I am pleased to announce with a liberal application of the oven, we have removed the mold. You can see there's a giant crack there where the two mold halves were supposed to be permanently joined. Turns out they were temporarily joined. And there was the corresponding bump in the actual parts uh, resin mixture there. So that was part of the problem. Momo, you can see, was very helpful in the process. And you can see where I ended up stabbing the mold a whole bunch of times with a screwdriver trying to get it out. Uh, thermal cycling it the third time turns out was uh, really the key to success there. So obviously this process didn't work great. We will improve it for next time. So method one did not work great at all. The mold finally did release, but I had to heat it above the resin's heat deflection temperature. And now this final part has like a way lower rigidity and now the material is very brittle. So this part is not good to fly. I think you could probably tune this a little bit, but at the end of the day, we're destroying the mold. And if we want to be able to produce lots of sapphire nose cones, that's kind of a huge downside. Okay, let's talk about the second method that I tried. The second method I tried is to create a super smooth 3D printed mold by way of vapor smoothing. Vapor smoothing is a process where a solvent vapor is circulated around a part inside of a vapor chamber, and this smooths out any ridges or bumps. It's really good at getting rid of the layer lines, which are the bane of our existence with this type of 3D printed mold. Lots of plastics are susceptible to vapor smoothing and acetone, but some filaments are particularly well suited for this. ASA is perfect, so I printed this new nose cone mold in Prusament ASA and built myself my own little vapor smoothing chamber. Now it's still important to sand these molds to get the high points knocked down and to start with as smooth a surface as possible. These then went into the vapor chamber for between 60 to 90 minutes. Big, big caveat here. The amount of time you need in the vapor chamber depends wildly on your brand of filament, the outdoor temperature, the design of the chamber, and your part geometry. So if you do this, I really encourage you to test out a smaller part first and iron out the vapor smoothing time. You also need to print your part with really thick walls and preferably with 100% infill. This is an example of a mold that didn't have thick enough walls and was in the chamber for way too long, so you can see the infill imprinting through into the final surface. Once the mold was vapor smoothed and allowed to reharden, I used paraffin wax to fill in any obvious cracks like this seam here between the two mold halves. When it was time for the layup, I added two coats of spray on mold release and then I added the sleeves. This time I added each sleeve and then I wetted it out with a paintbrush, which made the process way, way easier. As soon as a wetted sleeve touches the layer underneath it, it's super difficult to move. The layers stick together. These sleeves are also really weird because you can't pull them into place. As soon as you pull on the sleeve, it tightens and then binds to the part underneath it. So you have to push the sleeves into place from above. So it's kind of like pushing ropes into place. It's a very strange process. After curing, it was time to get the mold out and it did not come out straight away. So to ease everything apart, I did two trips between the freezer and running the part under hot water. When I did this, you could hear these little pops as the mold started to release. After the second trip under the hot water, the mold was able to be squeezed out. Well, mom. Why can't you be my assistant and hold the phone? Ooh, it moved more. This is coming clean out. Look at that. Okay, that didn't work at all. I need to push slowly. Uh, touching these is a really great way to get your finger stabbed. Now we're gonna switch hands, hold on. I have no idea if this looks good on camera. My phone's under my chin. Oh, look at that. Look at that, you guys. And that's very sticky, or not sticky, very gooey, which is perfect. That's exactly what I wanted. All right, we got to get the rest of this out somehow. I think I just need to push really hard on this without stabbing myself. Look at that. Here's our mold. It's looking excellent. It's very wet, and that's the mold release agent that's still there. And you can see the wax has kept this crack mostly filled in. The, this crack looks really bad, but if I feel it, it really doesn't feel like there's anything there, which is perfect. And here you can see the first layup. I tried to do all the fancy stuff with the peel ply and the second one. This one looks pretty good. Obviously still needs to clean up the tops and bottoms of these, and that's our next step. 
The only thing left was cutting the ends off and sanding the part down, and here we have our final custom carbon fiber nose cone. The mold is also undamaged, so it's ready to be used again for however many nose cones you want to make. I'm a really big fan of this process, because you can use it to make other composite parts as well. You could 3D print all sorts of mold geometries and do layups in a ton of different shapes, with the vapor smoothing process giving you a smooth surface mold finish without the need for extremely fine sanding and polishing, and you don't need any funky mold release devices. So if you're making rocket nose cones and don't have any extra extra large composite mold releases on hand, this is another technique that absolutely works. I do plan on making some improvements before I start making a bunch of sapphire nose cones. First, I think the mold shrank a little bit in the vapor chamber, because the nose cone is a really, really tight fit. Okay, so the nose cone doesn't fit. Uh, <laughs> it just doesn't fit at all. It was already a pretty tight tolerance, but measuring it, the mold definitely shrank a little bit. So I'm just going to expand the outer diameter of the mold, reprint it, re-smooth it, and try this whole thing again. I also have this little ridge in the middle where the 6K toe sleeve slid down over the bump and it imprints this ring around the circumference of the nose cone. This is where we just have this extra layer of composite material that we didn't plan for in the mold. I think I just need to zip tie the top of the 6K sleeve in place before doing the other ones to keep that from happening. If any of the 3K sleeves slide, you know, half an inch or so, it doesn't end up mattering, but the 6K sleeve really cannot slide down below this lip. So coming up, we're going to be working on Sapphire's camera setup with clear optical resin lens covers, and we're also going to fly the airbrake rocket that I've been building. So if you want to see more projects like this, make sure you're subscribed, and I'll see you all in the next one.